for this uh, presentation. So what I'll be talking about uh, is an important topic for uh, research, obviously, and that is about writing manuscripts. Uh, I'll try to touch on things that you should be doing and things that you should avoid uh, doing while you are writing uh, a scientific manuscript. So first of all, why do we write? Um, and I think it's important to keep that in mind when we're writing manuscripts, uh, because that dictates how we write things. Uh, first of all, we write uh, papers because we want to disseminate information. So we want the information to be known to the others. So that, that dictate that it has to be simple, understandable, uh, logical. Uh, also uh, to share ideas, discoveries, perspective to the broader audience. Also, uh, sometimes we write manuscript as part of job requirement. Um, definitely many of us work in research, do it because of the professional or personal satisfaction. And um, um, manuscripts uh, are important part of uh, uh, obtaining funding. Uh, so to keep a track of, uh, of your professional uh, growth. Mm -hmm. Oops. Hello. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes, prop, you're clear. Yeah, it was muted, I think. Yeah. Okay, sorry. So, uh, so what we'll, I'll talk in this um, presentation about the uh, writing manuscripts and emphasize things that you should be done and things should not be done in writing manuscript. And before this, I think we need to keep in mind what's objective of writing a paper. Uh, we write a paper because we want to disseminate information. And therefore, if you want to disseminate information, the information has to be clear, has to be logical, has to flow uh, properly. Uh, we need to share ideas, discoveries, perspective to broader audience. Um, we write papers because uh, sometimes this is part of our uh, job requirement, uh, promotions, etc. Uh, many of us who do research do it because of um, personal or scientific satisfaction. And also writing paper is important to have a track record that is important for funding and grants. But writing paper doesn't start when you uh, write the first sentence. It really should start much earlier. Start with the pre-study preparation. So first, you should critically read and be familiar with similar papers on the similar topic, have the right question developed and the right hypothesis, uh, and uh, conduct your study at the highest scientific and ethical standards. So, uh, so the ethics is important. 
And sometimes uh, this one of the problems in, in some papers, we really need to indicate that the study has received the appropriate approvals, IRB consent registered in clinical trials if, if appropriate. Also be aware of certain misconducts in writing uh, papers. Uh, plagiarism is cutting, pasting from different sources. Falsification is to basically make up the data. Um, uh, and fabric fabrication is completely making up the data, falsification, um, maybe filling gaps with inf information that is not correct. Authorship fraud is a paper has authors that have not, done, not, have not done anything with the study, not related, and also not disclosing conflict of interest. So uh, that's also very important, conflict of interest uh, becoming um, uh, an area of focus, whether this conflict of interest can be uh, financial, commercial, or even sometimes intellectual. So all these need to be very clear, um, and we should avoid all types of medical um, uh, writing mis misconduct, uh, as mentioned here. So general tips. Um, uh, the paper, try to, when you write, be patient-centered and not numbers-centered. So the focus is on the patient. And um, maybe many of us, when you write paper, you, you don't intentionally feel this, but the paper that talks about the patients um, probably attract your attention more than the paper that talks about focus on the numbers, focus on um, uh, the outcomes, but that doesn't mention the patient. So try always to say, we enroll this number of patients. We to keep the th patient in the center of the study. Also, I think avoid emphasis of statistical significance. Don't be trapped by p-values, please. So uh, having a p-value that looks significant is not by itself important. It is the clinical significance. So sometimes we see a difference very, very tiny, uh, but statistically significant. People make a big deal out of it. And sometimes um, the opposite way, maybe the not reach statistical significance, but there is something important clinically and is uh, dismissed. So the p-value, you should really have the interpretation in the proper context. Write vividly. Write vividly means write as if you are talking to somebody else. Um, describe what you mean in specific and concise terms. Uh, and writing should be fluent, similar way to reading, similar to speaking, should be um, very clear. And write for the readers uh, and not to please peer reviewers. When you write, the, the message sentences have to be clear. You put the reader um, in, the, in the center. Imagine a reader reading this sentence, whether he will understand it or not. So write as if you are talking to an informed colleague. Write as if you are explaining a new technique to an experienced research technician. So what are the parts of the of the manuscript? We start with the title, abstract, introduction, methods, results, discussion, and conclusion. So we're gonna go through these uh, um, one by one. So the title, the title should be short and concise. And uh, different um, journals have different guidelines for, for titles, but generally short and concise title is important, should be easy to understand, and should give an accurate idea about the methodology and the content of the study. Um, poor title is a title that is misleading. Try to sell a message that is not there or non-specific or use exact sentence, sentences as in the text. So I selected a few papers uh, or titles um, just to illustrate the point. So for example, here, you read this title, you understand what this paper is about. Fungal infection associated with contaminated methylprednisone injection. It really gives the full story. Even if you don't read the whole article, you are understand what what uh, the study is about. Fungal infections associated with contaminated methylprednisone injections. So you know that there is fungal infection. You know that there is methylene methylprednisone injection. 
you know that the methylprednisolone, the study confirmed that these were contaminated and that the patients who got these got the infagal infection. So a lot of information actually in the title. The abstract is a summary of the study and it should, uh, should state the objectives clearly and concisely. Should be short, but uh, not to exclude key information and should demonstrate the findings that are important uh, and the study and how the study uh, and that the study was carefully done. Poor abstract is an abstract that is inconsistent with other parts of the manuscript. So sometimes we see uh, things that are written in the abstract, but they don't reflect what's in the paper or what in the paper doesn't reflect what the manuscript. The numbers sometimes in the manuscript may not be consistent with the numbers in the uh, abstract. All these will reflect poor uh, abstract. Uh, using same sentences as on the body of the paper also is not a good idea. Try to use uh, different language. So this is the abstract of that uh, paper I mentioned about the contaminated methylprednisolone. You could see it, this is like 250 words, not, not long. It has multiple sections, background methods, results, conclusions. So it's almost the same paper, but much shorter uh, version. And it has to the, it has the objective of the study. We initiated an investigation for, into fungal infection associated with injection of methylprednisolone acetate that was purchased from single com, uh, compounding pharmacy, for example. Okay, so the objective is there. Uh, and the, mm, so it's really summarized the whole paper. Introduction, remember, um, remember the beginning of the paper, beginning of a lecture, beginning of anything makes, uh, give you the, the first impression. So bad beginning makes a bad ending. If the introduction is not good, uh, people lose interest in the paper. So the beginning is the last chance the reader has to put your book down before they start to hate you for wasting their time and money. Is really the beginning. Uh, you you write the beginning. You you you'll be hooked into writing reading the rest, or you stop. So what's in the introduction? Not a lot of things. Sometimes people write very long introduction. This is not right. The introduction has a focus. It should indicate why the study is needed. Um, and what's the objective? Really two sections, why the study is needed and what's the objective of the study. So why is it needed should be a summary of the previous work and why the present study is needed to be done. So, um, so let's take this injection of methylprednisolone. Was this ever been described before um, and why the study is needed? And then you describe the study objective. This is from one of our papers uh, a few years ago about intensive insulin uh, therapy, randomized control trial in medical and surgical patients. And we start by saying the problem. Why, what the, what's the nature of the problem? What's known? What's known that there was a trial by Vandenberg showing that uh, ins intensive insulin therapy reduces mortality. But there people cautioned that this may be not applicable. There were other study that stopped because significant increase in hypoglycemia with improved survival. And because of, of uh, these concerns, this question remains open. So that's really uh, why a new study is needed. And then because of uncertainty about the impact of intensive insulin therapy on outcome of critical patients, methodological concerns in existing studies the potential risk of hypoglycemia calls for the further studies to be done. And then we'll mention the objective of the study. And here, the objective of the study was to examine whether intensive insulin therapy is beneficial in reducing mortality in medical, non-operative, and surgical post-operative ICU patients. So um, is the rationale why the study is needed, where the existing knowledge has stopped, and then 
the why the, then our the purpose of the study. And you could see here the objective is a precise objective. It has the intervention, it has the population, it has the comparison, and it has the outcomes. The PICO follows the PICO. Okay, PICO format. So good introduction goes right to the essence of the problem in order to focus on the reader attention. So this introduction that I showed you, which is really brief, didn't say that hyperglycemia is bad and glucose is a problem and all this, and diabetes is common and doesn't say all that. Just goes to the right. That there is a study, the study showed reduction mortality. There is other study did not show reduction mortality. There were concerns about methodology. Therefore, a study is needed. Uh, and one of the common mistakes people write, they start to write almost like a review article in the introduction, which is uh, not the right thing to do. So a uh, good introduction goes to the essence of the problem, provide adequate background information and support by the literature, uses references carefully. So you need to know what references to use and which ones you shouldn't use. So there are, um, it really reflect how you know, how much you know about the literature and defines terms that are used in the title as needed. So good introduction, short, uh, and most of the introduction should be written in the present tense because it primarily reflects established knowledge. So it is what we know now, okay? What we know now. The objective uh, should be written um, in a manner uh, uh, analogous to a 15 second summary of patient case. So the, uh, the objective should be precise. And as I said, should follow the PICO format. Uh, we talked about this. So this is the, the uh, fungal infection. So here the introduction, introduction is very brief. This is the introduction. And it has like one sentence, two sentences, to explain the background information. And then the third sentence is objective. Goes direct to the topic. Poor introduction is an uh, introduction that doesn't reflect the importance or the novelty or originality of the study. Not intriguing, boring, long, indirect. Um, uh, the study question is vague or not specified. The uh, study questions, purpose, objective, and hypothesis are confused and not clear. All these will give bad introduction. So this uh, editor says, uh, respond to uh, somebody who submitted a paper. Dear contributor, thank you for submitting your story. We re uh, regret that it doesn't suit our present needs. If it ever does, we are in trouble. Methods. Methods, people don't take it seriously, but it is actually the most important part of the paper. The most important part of a paper. Remember you are writing scientific paper. So the greatest invention in the 19th century and the 20th and 20th is the invention of methods having clear methods. This is methods is the experiment. This is what methods is how you did this study. So methods should describe the experimental design in enough detail that a competent, competent worker can repeat your experiment. So for the study, in my opinion, as a, as a, uh, as a um, investigator, and as a reviewer for a journal, I could tell you, we make decision about accepting papers or refusing papers mainly based on the methods. For a study to be scientific, to have scientific merit, it should be reproducible. And to be reproducible, the method should give enough details. So a good reviewer would read the methods carefully. If there is serious doubt that the experiments could be repeated, the reviewer will recommend rejection of the manuscript, no matter how the results are, look great. 
So the method should give enough detail. Most of this section should be written in the past tense because the study is done. We conducted the study, we randomized patients, we gave this medication, etc. So good method section gives full details. Most of this section should be written in the past tense, should be organized in a meaningful way. Um, so what do we mean by meaningful? It should, should follow a meaningful flow. So um, it should start, for example, by the setting. So uh, imagine you want to do experiment in a, a hospital. You need first the hospital, right? Then you need the patients. Then you need the inclusion exclusion criteria. Then you, you talk about the intervention. Then you look at outcomes. Then you have the uh, data collection. Then you do the statistical analysis. It follows this logic. So you should not describe randomization and then go to methods and then describe hospital. This will be confusing. So it should follow a logical uh, flow. Um, describe all aspects of the study design, how the data was collected. Describe the data collection in detail. Who collected the data? What data was collected? Very specific. When, where, how, why? Define all the variables. So if you'd say, we collected data about ventilator-associated pneumonia, you have to tell me how you define ventilator-associated pneumonia. Uh, provide reproducible detail of statistical analysis. This is how we did the analysis. We used this test. We did the multivariate analysis, including these variables, one, two, three, four, five, should be written in detail. So good method section will uh, describe the setting. Setting meaning <clears throat> where the experiment was done. Subjects, uh, the patients, describe the patients, what the eligibility criteria, inclusion, exclusion criteria, what the procedures, uh, for example, uh, intensive insulin therapy versus conventional insulin therapy, high tidal volume versus low tidal volume, high driving pressure versus low driving pressure, neuromuscular blockers versus neuromuscular blockers should be described. described. Uh, outcomes, what, are, what is the primary outcome? What are the secondary outcomes? How was sample size and the statistical methods? So stating where the study was done. We've conducted a clinical trial in 16 ICUs in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and the length of time covered by the, set, uh, by the study is done between March 2021 and, uh, and April 2022. Uh, who are the subjects in the study? We enrolled critically ill patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, um, et cetera. Subjects how we selected the patients, what are the inclusion criteria. They have to have this amount of oxygen. They have to have uh, this type of infiltrate. Exclusion criteria, we did not, we excluded this type of patients. We excluded this type of patients. Randomization, how the randomization was done. We randomized patients uh, to one-to-one -one using a web-based uh, randomization system to um, helmet versus uh, conventional oxygen therapy, we followed patients up to 180 days, et cetera. So patient follow up and who followed them up. And we made a phone call at 180 days to get information about their uh, quality of life, for example. You should define the procedures done in the study, especially operational definitions developed by the investigator. So for example, when you use helmet, you should define what helmet, what type of helmet, how you use it, what's the settings, if there is unusual instrument or methods used, should provide reference or brief description. Readers may or may not agree with the definition, but it's possible to readers to make their own judgment. Um, for uh, uh, materials, should provide technical specification quantities and source. So if you have specific device used, you should give the manufacturer, what type, what um, brand, etc. The outcome should be clearly stated. Uh, remember that some outcomes are relatively simple to assess, for example, mortality, but some not very easy like function. So function, we measured functional outcome using this scoring system or functional quality of life using uh, this system. And you have to describe the system because people may not familiar with it. Um, should uh, 
give me enough assure, assurance that the assessment is um, done reliably. Um, and so reliable assessment of the outcome is just as important as the assessment of inclusion and diagnostic criteria. Poor method section is a method that um, report things that actually were not done, um, which gives you impression that somebody has cut and paste from other source, or the methods is missing, is really doesn't give you enough information uh, to understand what's how the study was done. Results. Results, now the next section is the results. Results section, uh, good section should give you data in a natural order. So natural order, the full population, the patient characteristics, then the intervention, so what we've done for them, and then last, then the outcome. Um, sometimes you see people write things and they're confused. Outcome first and then it comes to the intervention. No, it should follow a logical order. How you do them in, in, in real life. You do, you get the patient information first, then you give intervention and then you monitor for outcome. Uh, should contain the findings directed at the question posed in the introduction and should present statistical information appropriately. Should be comprehensive and convincing. Good section prevent data in a similar variables consistently. Um, uses well designed tables, graphs, flow charts, histograms, figures, uh, and cite and summarize it in the text. The these uh, these uh, tables and graphs should be simple and self explanatory and re not repetition of the written text. The um, use consistent format, clearly define all the terms. So uh, it's very important in the figures that these should be stand alone. Um, so when you look at the figure by itself, the figure should stand alone. When you look at it by itself, you are able to understand what the message this figure is giving. Um, and um, should have the units. Uh, these little things, but they are so important. Sometimes people miss them and you don't understand what's happening. Should have a clearly written legends for each figure. The um, results also should provide schematic summary of the study, showing the number and disposition of patient each stage. So the flow diagram. So flow diagram, how many patients we screened, how many patients were included, how many patients were excluded, how many patients were randomized, how many patients received the intervention, how many patients had the outcome, and um, should provide all this information. So this is a flow diagram, this number of patients enrolled in a study, this is how many eligible, how many enrolled, how many underwent randomization, to receive this, this is the uh, high flow versus control ventilation, and how many had the outcome uh, measured. Guidelines for writing results describe the characteristic of each group to ensure that there's um, uh, no one category include atypical subjects. So um, we should have information about the screened, excluded, eligible not randomized, randomized, those who did not complete treatment, loss of follow-up, or completed the full protocol. Uh, indicate how the sample uh, group represent the population as a whole. Um, indicate if the allocation of patients or masking was successful, and describe the nature of follow-up. So we followed patients until one day. So for example, in our helmet paper about quality of life, and this is very important for long-term follow-up, you have to report how long the patients were followed up actually. So we reported how many uh, days after the enrollment patients were followed. 
uh, for observation based on judgment, provide assessment or agreement between the observers. We need also to report in the, in the results section, deviations or violations to the protocol, um, uh, side effects, adverse events, serious adverse events should all be reported. Outcomes, um, uh, reporting outcome, of course, is the most important part because this is what the study is about. So you reported as absolute change. So you report there were uh, um, this number of death in the first group and this number of death in the other group. Then you report the absolute change. How was the difference between the two groups for the primary endpoint with 95% confidence interval? P-value should be reported for the primary analysis. Uh, the other P-values for, uh, for the rest of the outcome depend on your statistical analysis plan. Um, and uh, uh, unless, I mean, in, in certain journals, they require that you have uh, adjusted for multiple testing. Uh, otherwise, you don't report all the p-values. Poor results section is a section that doesn't review, give you the full results, either intentionally or without justification or unintentionally. Some people try to show the results partially and they think this is smart. No, I would tell them this is not smart at all. It's a big, a big problem. Uh, you should be transparent in reporting your results. Um, and uh, reviewers will, will pick it up very quickly. So um, not accounting for all the study subjects. You said that you enrolled 200 patients, but then when you report outcomes, you report 190, for example. Or the numbers don't add up or the numbers in paper are not consistent. So what's written in the text is different from what's in the abstract, what's in the table. Uh, so sometimes when you write papers, you make multiple edits and corrections. You need to make sure that the numbers are consistent throughout the paper. Um, if there are patients categories, they should be adding up to 100%. Um, and if they don't add up, you should have a justification. So if you say I'm categorizing patients to uh, medical and surgical patients, well, they should have add up to 100%. If this, these are the two categories, um, diabetic, non-diabetic, the total should be the whole group, unless you have missing values. <clears throat> so how do you make sure that this happens? Really very important. I double check the... Uh, number so many times to ensure consistency across all the paper. Uh, the numbers and the tables have to be double checked, triple checked um, uh, many times. Inconsistency in the information between tables, graphs, text, uh, abstract are a problem because for the reviewer, um, he may, he may think this is an um, innocent typo, but it could also uh, trigger that this is a study that was analyzed and reanalyzed and rewritten. Um, so the author, when he rewrote this, fixed it in certain places and forgot to the others. Or it gives an impression that the authors are not very careful in their procedures. So if you are not careful with the numbers, you probably not, were not careful in the intervention itself. Um, so it makes big doubts about the whole study. Poor results section, if there are errors in the analysis. Um, well, the, some errors are fatal errors, but there are some errors that are okay. Uh, lack of power is an issue. Um, uh, certainly it's an important issue, but it's not a fatal error for, for writing manuscript. And this requires early statistical consultation. Um, failure for adjustment for multiple comparison. When you do a lot of analyses, remember p-value of 0 0.05 means that you have a 5% chance that uh, the difference observed is related to uh, random. So if you do 20 tests, there's one of them gonna by chance, 
uh, appear to be statistically significant. If you do 40, then two of them. So don't make big deal out of the finding if you have one or two p-values that appear to be significant when you do a lot of testing. In this case, what's the right thing to do is to adjust for multiple comparisons. And there are different ways. Um, and this p-value that you observe probably become non-significant. Um, poor results section is that uh, the analysis was done by treatment received by per protocol. So of the, the main analysis should be done by intention to treat, not per protocol. Um, if, the, um, if the study doesn't really give you assurance that the data confirm to the assumptions of the analysis. Next section is the discussion. And the discussion is discussing your study, is not discussing the topic, okay? People make mistake when they write discussion. They write discussion about the topic. It's not, it's discussion of your own findings. So it should start with summary of the findings of your own study and should confine the discussion to the study results and compare it with other published literature. It should provide practical information, emphasize new information that this result provide. So good discussion section sh should be focused, should discuss the implication of your own findings, should consider explanation of your findings in light of the rest of the literature, should discuss the limitation and strength of the own study. While poor section is discussion section is um, logic is loose, flight of ideas is too wide. It's just discovering a topic, um, not discussing the own study. Uh, presentation is biased. Also as another problem, when you try to oversell your findings, omitting key limitation from other investigators. Uh, or the key results really not discussed while well, discuss general information. I've seen this many times, unfortunately. When references are either used outdated or uh, misrepresented, or when you start to speculate beyond the findings of your own study, um, or overstate your findings or oversell your findings, also a problem. A poor discussion section does not address limitation of the study. Uh, when you see inconsistency across the sections of the paper, like comments made in the discussion, um, not exactly follow the same question posed in the introduction, doesn't really follow exactly what's the data presented in the results, has to be all consistent. And consistency means to the point that even the sequence of words. So if there are two interventions, so if I say uh, I'm gonna compare helmet, um, non-invasive ventilation to conventional, conventional ventilation. Good writing means that you always mention helmet first and conventional oxygen therapy next. Don't ever in this paper say the opposite way. It it will immediately distract the reader. So in the describing the results, helmet first, conventional first, second. Helmet first. In the discussion, helmet first, conventional second. So this consistency is so important. So this consistency of wording, but consistency of the idea, consistency of the outcomes, is so important across the paper. So one way always important when you write a paper is always start by writing the objective of the paper, which is the last sentence in the introduction, according to the PICO. And go back every time when you write your discussion and conclusion to the PICO to ensure that you are following the same um, logic. Do not extrapolate beyond the data analyzed in the study. So um, that will give a poor discussion section. So you start to, for example, if you start to have conclusion based on 
measurements not included in the study. You did not measure uh, functional outcome, and then you start to say, uh, you talk about functional outcome improved. Well, you didn't even measure it. Uh, conclusion drawn that are no longer, uh, for a longer, require a longer period of follow-up than what you did in your study. Don't speculate this way. Don't speculate that the study is applicable to a group of patients are, that are, do not represent what's are included in the study. All these are bad extra extrapolations. Last section is a conclusion. Conclusion section should be clear and strong, should be supported fully by the results presented, should be limited to the boundaries of the study presented. So don't extrapolate beyond your findings, should describe any further research that should be considered if applicable. Poor conclusion section, uh, restate is if you just repeat the same words you use in the results. If the conclusion doesn't answer the study question, as I said, we have an objective um, in the PICO, the conclusion should address the PICO. So we said that there is a risk of contaminated fungal infection related to contaminated methylprednisolone. Then the conclusion said we report uh, five cases of contaminated, or we did not find any evidence of fungal infection related to uh, methylprednisolone injection. For example, should address the same question you, you address in the objective. The conclusion should not uh, set limits to the, for application. So before you submit the paper, make sure you update the literature review. Very often when we do the study, between the time you plan your study and you write your manuscript, maybe it's new uh, projects or uh, new uh, uh, studies being done. So make sure you review them and you address them in your paper. And always quote and reference primary resources. Do not try to avoid um, referencing book chapters or uh, review articles, or unless I mean, sometimes it can be relevant, um, but generally you should refer, if you are referring to a certain study, then reference that study itself, not somebody else referring to it, not secondary study. Do not provoke the reviewers by misspelling, incorrect formatting. It's so common, unfortunately, in many people I've seen writing, lots of misspellings. Um, we have an issue with the capital letters. People either overuse capital letters or underuse capital letters. Typos. Uh, so please proofread the final uh, manuscript for logic, for accuracy, flow, spelling, etc. There are many softwares that help you spelling. The spell checker, at least, I mean, Word has simple, it can avoid lots of mistakes. Uh, give it to a colleague to read it and fix it as much as possible from editing standpoint. Uh, the, uh, when you submit to a paper and you get a review, uh, first of all, don't be defensive and say, no, no, all this. you should thank the reviewers for their input and acknowledge the value. I review many papers. When I review paper, I spend hours literally write, reading the paper. So, um, and even if I give critique, critical comments, uh, this is after I spent some time and give it thoughts. And these comments actually help improving the paper. So you should thank the reviewers for their input, acknowledge the value. Do not ignore their request. Um, comply or you feel it's doesn't, you, you don't want you justify why not, but try to comply with as many of the requests as possible. And believe me, most of the requests will help improving the papers. So dear contributor, we have received your latest manuscript. Why did you send it to us? What did we do ever to hurt you? So why papers fail? Why people get rejected? There are many reasons. One, there are technical reasons. One is that the journal actually is not, this paper is not within the scope of the journal. Um, or the authors did not follow the instructions for authors because each journal has its own format. So if it doesn't follow 
Um, that's the reason for um, rejection. Unclear purpose of the paper, poor writing generally, um, lots of mistakes, flight of ideas. Uh, ethical concerns. Remember that uh, journals have, uh, they check before they even they look at it for plagiarism to ensure that they, you did not replicate it from somewhere else. Uh, if they consider it low priority paper for them. Also, if you if they send you review and you uh, did not comply with the request, uh, that's that could be a reason for rejection. But there is also cognitive reasons. Maybe the paper doesn't have anything novel or the question is not really important, trivial, uh, or there are some scientific flaws in the study itself, or there is selection bias, or the study underpowered, or the groups are uh, wrong groups or wrong question was asked. Or if you have the methods is not really the right method, whether we're talking about the statistics or the uh, procedures, or if you over try to overstate your results um, and you did not describe it, you didn't put it in the right context. So with this, um, I conclude, uh, thank you, submitting for a story to our magazine to save you time or enclosing two rejection slips, one for this story and one for the next one. So thank you very much and we'll open it for questions and I hope I summarized the key um, tips for writing a manuscript. Of course, writing manuscript at the end require practice. Um, and um, I think with experience, people build, uh, um, doesn't come from writing one paper, but uh, you build it with time. But uh, think simple and, and logical. So questions, Dr. Hani. Dr. Hani and then Dr. Khalid. Uh, Rose, are you unmuting? I'm not sure. Um, Salam alaikum. Yes, Prof. You can hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, enlightening as usual. I just wanted to thank you. And for our uh, junior researchers, I'm really happy that I've invited many to attend. I can see their names. Uh, I'm uh, really honored to have uh, to meet uh, to learn from you each time. And uh, what I will suggest to our junior researchers is also to be uh, to link themselves in initially with uh, uh, some ongoing research teams that could guide them, especially so they will not get a rejection or because the first paper is usually tough, but yeah. it becomes easier with the practice with the such wonderful tips you mentioned, Prof. Thank you very much. Great point. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani. Dr. Khad Maghribi. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Yassin. Thank you very much. Just, uh, I have a question, Dr. Yassin. If you can guide uh, us for the references, uh, what you do in terms of references, how you uh, rightly refer to the certain references, the arrangement, uh, what are the references you have to mention, uh, and how to refer to any reference with any information, uh, if you guide us through this, please. So two parts of, thank you, Dr. Khad, for this important question. Two parts for this. One is the technical part. I, I personally, uh, I, I think it's always advised to use uh, one of the softwares for uh, uh, references. I used EndNote, uh, but there other people use different ones because this helps managing the references uh, uh, easier. Um, but the selection of references is important, which reference you select. So it depends on the study question, obviously. So if I'm doing a study on high tidal volume versus low tide or low tidal volume versus uh, high tidal volume, you really need to reference the key um, studies that address this question and why is it important, for example, to study it now? For example, 
So uh, I would make sure that I refer to the key papers that people consider to be reference. Otherwise, um, and, and refer to the new systematic reviews. Always a good idea to review the most recent systematic reviews because systematic reviews, somebody has already reviewed the literature for this question and looked at what's the most recent. I don't know if that addresses your question. So the technical part, uh, I personally use EndNote. I find it uh, very useful. Uh, so if you add a reference in the middle, it will change all the numbers, uh, for example. And then if you change, submit to different paper, you can change the format easily. In the past, we used to type them, which it's really a lot of headache. Next uh, question. Does that answer your question to Khaled? Dr. Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed Nahas. Uh, Rose, please, can you unmute? And then Dr. Ahmed Rabi. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Yasin. Uh, Dr. Yasin, my question about the method section. Uh, as you mentioned, it needs to be elaborately written uh, with a lot of details. But I've noticed with the, with the wording limitation on, on part of the journal, um, I faced a struggle to, to, to make it in detail. So is there a way of bypassing this, maybe submitting an index or a, a separate, or I'm not sure how we can يعني, uh, write a detailed method with the wording limitation? Excellent point. So for randomized control trials, for example, uh, the method section has to be really detailed. And very often uh, we write it in a separate paper, Aslan. You write the protocol and submit it for publication a long time before the main manuscript. Uh, then you could refer to that publication. Uh, other, alternatively, uh, some of the method section can go to the supplement. So now you find in many papers, um, Supplement the method section could be in the main paper, not very long, but they refer you to the supplement for more details, or you can put a lot of details. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank but, you. But, uh, what, what, one more question: uh, Can a video be uh, included in, uh, like, uh, if we, if I'm doing a video of uh, of uh, of an experiment, can that be included in 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 the article, or uh, there is no way of including such a thing? Uh, it can certainly be included as supplement in all journals because now all journals have online supplement. So that's not an issue. But in the main paper, I don't think so. Um, it depends on the journal. But as, as a supplement, uh, it definitely can be included. So JAMA, you know, all journals can include, um, can include the video. Right, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Hisham, the bar. Or Dr. Hisham, you're muted, uh, Dr. Hisham. Salam alaikum rahmatullah. Salam alaikum rahmatullah. Salam alaikum rahmatullah. Firstly, really, I would, uh, I would like to appreciate you. Very, very good lecture, very good presentation. This uh, very briefly and very clear. Thank you so much, Dr. Yasin. Yeah. Second, please, can you provide us with some of the journals for submission, with accredited journal for submission uh, papers? Because really, usually you are looking for good journals, but maybe we have no good accredited journal for this submission? Well, I think this depends on the topic. Uh, the, you know that there are hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands now of uh, journals. Um, uh, so it depends on the topic and the interest of the journal. Um, so it, it really depends on what's, what the article is about. But one maybe, thing, so you maybe. raise an important point, you make, you make sure that the journal is one not considered one of the called predatory journals. 
uh, these journals they are just publishing for for the money only uh, and they are not peer reviewed they are not indexed you have to be careful not to be fall in the trap of of these journals but well respected society journals scientific journals there there are so many now okay thank you thank you dr ahmed rabi Dr. Ahmed. Uh, can you unmute Dr. Ahmed and then Dr. Fadi? And then Munira? Rose. Uh, Rose, are you with us? Yeah, Dr. Fadi, you are unmuted. All right, Assalamu alaikum. So thank you, Professor, and thank you very much again for this uh, comprehensive uh, review about writing manuscript. Fine. Uh, I have a question regarding the uh, reply to the reviewers. Sometimes we get stuck with the reviewers. Uh, well, actually, we noticed recently, uh, with my humble uh, experience with the research, that some reviewers are not really uh, that much experience with uh, with the paper that you have submitted, so then uh, that's why you get stuck with them, with the, some replies. For mm -hmm. example, let's say like uh, regarding the methodology, one of the uh, one of the times that we use the scale to assess something, how to interpret that scale, whether we interpret that scale as a dichotomous uh, scale or we interpret it as a continuous. So in the literature, there have been different ways in the uh, how to how to analyze that scale. So uh, my question is how to deal with such I would say a stubborn uh, reviewer, uh, especially regarding the uh, that such issues uh, related to the methodology, and sometimes let's say uh, they ask for strange things uh, how to display the data in the tables or, or in the text. Uh, unusual uh, things they ask to include in the methodology. So would you follow them uh, in their uh, unusual uh, request and how to deal with the stubborn uh, reviewer? And thank you. Thank you, for this great question. So um, first of all, I try to acknowledge their comment. And uh, if I think this is not the correct way, uh, I'll provide explanation why not and with the reference. So try to handle it uh, as scientific as possible without being defensive. Uh, and uh, you could always say, uh, we would like the, we, we thank the reviewer for this comment. We think this is an important point. However, uh, this uh, outcome is usually uh, measured uh, in other studies in this way and this reference, for example, in the study of blah, 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 and you put the references. Um, we will, uh, sometimes if you are really get stuck with the reviewer, you could say we would like to have the uh, editor advice on this issue. So uh, try to get yourself out of the uh, emotion and uh, say, we don't agree, um, but we would like the advice of the editor. Uh, I had one paper some time ago where the reviewer continue to insist on requesting data that I simply don't have. And it's we acknowledged from the first time that we don't have it. So he kept, we had like five reviews. He came, keeps asking the same question. The last time I, I wrote to the editor, we have addresses many points and there's nothing else I can add. So we would like an editorial um, advice on this issue. So they accepted the paper. So sometimes try to get the editor uh, on your side, and the only way to get him on your side is to to uh, remain cool and reply to things as scientific and objective as possible. That's that's my feeling. Dr. Ahmed Rabi. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Rasi. Thank you for this valuable uh, lecture, actually. Uh, uh, my question is, um, uh, we as a non-native uh, English 
speaker. Uh, when we write uh, in a journal, did, did they consider this in mind? And uh, are you uh, advised to, to, to uh, before submission, to go to the English editing offices uh, before doing submission? Um, so I personally don't go to editorial offices. I, I don't use editor. I, I use my own language. Um, and with time, I think the language has improved. Um, the journals do take that in consideration. Um, so very often we think that our language, uh, uh, your language, uh, Dr. Ahmed, could be as good as Yes, many American uh, native language when they write scientific. That's why when, when we go to the, the, to, the, the to these offices, I, we find surprisingly that, that no any uh, major changes or uh, even minor between between uh, our writing and the uh, the review. So I, I don't know, but some journals they ask clearly to have. Uh, uh, yeah, to have certificates uh, from from any uh, uh, office that uh, you did English uh, right, uh, editing. Yeah, well, if it's requested by the journal, you're stuck. But uh, most journals don't request it, and uh, I, I personally don't routinely use editing office. And also, the many journals, if you use an, a medical writer, they want you to. Um, uh to disclose this you should say who is who edited the paper yes exactly thank you thank you dr amnira can you unmute dr amnira assalamu alaikum presentation i have a couple of questions if i if i may uh, regarding uh, the referencing and quoting from other researchers and book, uh, you mentioned that we should uh, quote or uh, refer to the original uh, research, but sometimes the research you are written in a foreign language other than uh, the English. So in this case, should we refer uh, to the, the original article like in French or uh, in German? Uh, well, if it's that's the only way to do it, uh, that's the only reference in that topic. Um, yes, but I would think this is not a very common scenario, though. You know, I mean, if the only study that is done is written in French, uh, I, I have not came across this very often. Because at least the abstract is in English. But yes, so the answer, the long, the short answer to your question, if it's written in another language, and that's the only way that exists, uh, yes, you should reference it then. But I think this, you probably should be able to find something in English. I don't know if I answered your question. Do you have any specific? Uh, Example, the problem is if you reference something in Chinese or in Korean, uh, the reviewers will not understand it. And then they they become perplexed what, what to do. Okay. Any more questions? If no more questions, I'd like to thank you all for your time and uh, uh, appreciate all your engagement and great discussion and uh, wish you all good night. Thank you.